Johnny is my given name. America is my nation. The schoolhouse is my learning place. In heaven be my destination. Johnny is my given name. America is my That's a rhyme children used to scribble in their school books a long time ago. A time when this school was built. A time when we were proud of being educated. Through the years, we've lost some of that pride, taken our education for granted, have even grown neglectful. All around us, things have been changing. We've gone from the one-horse shade to the space satellite. And now, suddenly, schools have a lot to do with national security and our survival. Now there's trouble. And we realize that the trouble is with brains and training and technology. Here's a gas station attendant. He works six hours a night, six nights a week. The difference between this gas station attendant and most others is that this one has a bachelor's degree and a master's in education. He's a teacher in a high school. And the reason he works in a gas station is that teaching doesn't pay him enough to support his wife and two children. He likes being a teacher, but he's beginning to get a little tired of working 14 hours a day. There is a very real connection between the crisis in our schools and the crisis in American technology and American citizens must solve the teacher's problems. We have a choice. Either pay the price of devotion or pay a far greater price in years to come when our teacher shortage goes from the grayness of a crisis to the blackness of an American tragedy. America, no matter how we figure it, was short 159,000 classrooms in 1957. About one million children right now are being shortchanged in their deserved education because of half-day sessions. This is a school in an American city. Schools like this were built years ago. They might have been replaced, but the Second World War prevented that. So here they stand, outmoded, decaying. We wouldn't live in buildings like these, but a good many American kids are educated in them the war froze building materials, but it did not slow up the baby boom. Children kept right on being born, but no one was building schools. The result? Classroom shortage. Aside from depriving a good many children of proper education, overcrowded classrooms mean overwork. One reason why a lot of teachers want to quit. Sometimes the federal government creates a sudden increase in population in an area as a large military establishment. Here the government helps to build schools. Next year Congress will again take up the debate over federal aid to school construction and many other aspects of education. These are only partial answers. The main answer to the schoolroom shortage has to come from your local community. So far, your community has not solved the problems. No school. That's sure going to shoot the tax rate up. $40 this year, $42 next year. What we need is a little economy around here. Sure we do, but then we'd better economize on our children, on their brains, and on their future if we aren't willing to spend it on schools. But look at all these people and all this material. What is it all for? To educate a single child, not a class of children, but one single child. It looks like a great deal, 
but it takes a great deal to put one child all the way through school. Eric is in the middle of his elementary schooling. 50 or 60 years ago, when his grandfather was in the same grade, he got reading, writing, arithmetic, period. Let's listen to what Eric's learning this morning. Le chat est sur le table. Now, chat is the noun. Eh is the verb. French. Why, who ever heard of teaching French in grade school? Of all things. Why in the world would anyone want to learn French? Why in the world? Well, for one thing, the world's gotten a lot smaller since you went to school. Right now, America needs linguists to translate vitally important writings, and we don't have enough of them. Well, all right. But you know what they did in school today? They had an election. What do you think of that? How old were you before you understood the way our government works? Eric understands at his age, even though he lost that election. French elections. What happened to the things we learned in school? They're still taught, but differently. And it's made a little more interesting, more in tune with the world our kids are going to have to live in. It's a big job, but it gets bigger. And Eric gets bigger. Suddenly he isn't playing on swings and slides anymore. He's in high school, and he's at the point of deciding what he's going to do with the rest of his life. If he's lucky, he'll go to a high school that has a counseling system to help him make the right decision. Well, we've gotten your test scores, and it looks to us as if you ought to think seriously about engineering. Now, there are several courses here I'd like to recommend to you. So, Eric agreeing, he starts in. Math classes, drafting classes, all the things his career will demand of him. All the things good health demands of him. All the things that life demands of him. All the things that he demands of his school. That is the problem. How much we demand of our schools. The schools ought to teach manners, vitally important. I want my boy to learn a trade. Dentistry. Typing. Hairdressing. Ceramics. Cooking. Fix cars. How much should the schools do? Some people seem to feel that the schools should do just about everything. Everything that homes and clubs and communities used to do. Some seem to feel that the school should endlessly give and get no increase in salaries, no increase in funds, no increase in personnel. The time has come to redefine the function of a public school. The time has come to decide just what it is our schools must teach and to relieve them of those tasks that others should rightfully assume. This too, you must decide. Let me give you an example or two of how desperately America needs well-trained men. By 1960, operators for 210 atomic reactors will be needed. By 1980, they think we'll need 90 times that number. Only high school graduates need apply. To meet all of these demands, we have one final problem. The problem of persuading young Americans to stay in school. 10 American high school students. And the statisticians have figured out just what's going to happen to them. Four won't finish high school for one reason or another. Of these six who will graduate, three will go on to college. And of these three who go on to college, one and a half will graduate. One and a half out of 10 now in high school will graduate from college. 150 out of 1,000, a pretty small percentage for a country that has suddenly come to realize that its survival depends on highly trained brain power. 
This girl just quit high school. Why? I just can't keep my daughter interested in school anymore. She wants clothes and a lot of things we can't afford to give her. Yes, she wanted the glamour and pay of a good job. So she went job hunting. Only high school graduates need apply. So she ends up taking what she can get. Tests have shown that she would be capable of much more with the right education. Sometimes a student has no choice in the matter. This boy should be in college. He works for a company which employs scientists and engineers. With enough education, someday he might have been a scientist or an engineer. But even though America desperately needs scientists, this boy sorts mail. America's problem is deeper than money. It's deeper than the need for aids and grants. The problem involves our entire concept of education, not just problems of teachers, classrooms, curriculum, and student dropout. Here is a problem for a big nation, a rich nation, a nation perhaps so content with the material that it has neglected the intellectual. The time has come for America to realize that our citadel now is the intelligence, imagination, and curiosity of the trained mind. We cannot fortify America's educational system with teachers who can make more by driving a truck in buildings unfit to house the children of America by the waste of latent ability. The answer lies not in the stars, but very close to every American as close as your own child, and as close as the school your child attends. If we understand our school's problems, spend for its services, comprehend its limitations, then shall we be armed, spiritually, physically. Then shall we have a peace rich with the wonders that only the mind of man can create. How do you want these youngsters to grow up? Mass talk? because there isn't sufficient classroom space for them, indifferently taught because the teaching profession may fail to hold its outstanding people, half taught and prepared only for mediocrity because no one encouraged them to stay in school. Any or all of these things could happen to the children in your community unless you take an active interest in your school, in all schools, and express that interest meaningfully. Finally, to conclude this report on education in 1957, it is a pleasure to introduce the Honorable Marion B. Folsom, Secretary of Health, Education, and Welfare. Here in America, the welfare and happiness of the individual citizen is the goal of our society. We believe this world is governed by moral law. We believe that in such a world, there's infinite worth and dignity in the individual human spirit. Out of this belief comes our distinctive greatness as a nation. But all around the world today, liberty and freedom are challenged by a system of tyranny. That system holds that the goal of life for each individual is to serve the materialistic interest of the state. The communist state, therefore, directs the life of each citizen according to the government's concept of the national interest. In this struggle between liberty and tyranny, between morality and materialism, our free education system plays a crucial role. For in the final analysis, that society will win which best meets the needs of its people. And education in large part determines how effectively the American people work in the cause of human welfare. Each person in America, therefore, had a tremendous personal stake in meeting and solving the problems in education which have been discussed on this program. These problems are grave, and they are upon us now. Now is the time for each of us to accept our responsibility to support better schools and colleges for our young people. Now is the time to act on this responsibility. In so doing, we serve our own future 
and the cause of freedom everywhere.